when I jumped in at age 40 with my life savings, uh, I didn't have a, a wife, I didn't have a date, I didn't have a mortgage, and I could work for free for two or three years. And my friends actually did interventions. They thought I'd lost my mind. Like, what do you mean you're going to start a high school? You, you, you've never taught. You've never been in ed school. You were a C-minus average student in high school. And, uh, but when I did an evaluation of, the, of what was right and wrong with schools, was I thought, well, maybe I need to go to grad school. Maybe I need to teach. Maybe I need to be a, a principal. But when actually, when I actually pulled back and looked at it, the problem with public education isn't the fact that people want to teach. I mean, people want to teach. They don't, but their work conditions have to improve. You know, it's not that there, there aren't a lot of smart people who know how to do schools right. The politics aren't right. And my political background, I thought it could benefit the movement greatly by looking at this from a political aspect. And yes, also from an entrepreneurial aspect, you have to be successful. So the way I think an entrepreneur looks at the issue, if you're a for-profit company, um, I'm not always comfortable you know, comparing the two, but I think if, in, in a logical sense, is you find out who does something really well. And can you actually steal them? Can you merge with them? Or do you replicate them and do it better? So it, then it gets real easy. So when I was uh, bopping around Los Angeles looking at public schools, I was trying to find some that worked, and I didn't find any. I saw a lot of things. There were aspects of some public schools that worked. There were really determined crusaders, teachers. People cared about the system. It was just a horrible system. The, you know, the schools were 5,000 seats in some of the schools. They were very undemocratic. The parents were total outsiders. They were not involved in this game at all. Kids are in the, in the schools in some of the poor areas that I serve in Los Angeles, the schools look like prisons. Now, then I, and then I asked, well, what is, if I'm rich in Los Angeles, what does my school look like? You know, what does $25,000 a year get you? And then it gets real easy. When I looked at those schools, none of them were 5,000 or 2,000 or 1,000. They were three or four or 500, so they were small. Because then your kids don't fall through the cracks. But small is not everything. Second thing is they had high expectations for all kids. If I'm paying 25 grand a year, um, you're not going to push my kid off into a vocational path because of their skin color or shyness. Um, you, you know, you're going to have high expectations for all kids. And if my kid's behind, get them up to speed. That's what I'm paying all this money for. If I spent 25 grand on a, on a private school and half the money wasn't spent at the school site or 40%, but it was divvied up to some bureaucracy downtown, and it wasn't spent on the best teachers and the best equipment and the best development and the best facilities, I wouldn't invest in that school. You know, there's no way I would. And also, I wanted the school to be accountable for that kind of money. I'm a client. So if I have a problem, you'd call me back. And I'm treated in a democratic way. And then the fifth, and the fifth thing is um, that I also support the mission of the school. So I want to be part of this community. I want to volunteer. I don't want to go to a meeting once a month called the PTA meeting where people get up and yell at each other. I want to actually get my hands dirty and be part of this and part of my investment. So if that works, in and that works very well for the well-off in this country, why wouldn't that model work in a high-need area, you know, in a place where there's a 70% dropout? You know, what personalization wouldn't work for a Latino kid or an African-American kid or, or a poor white kid? Um, money in the classroom wouldn't attract the best teachers. Parents being involved in a meaningful way and high expectations wouldn't work. Of course it does. That's why Green Dot, we go in areas where there's 70% dropout rate, and we retain and graduate 80 to 90% of our kids. And three-fourths of them go to four-year colleges with the same kids and a little bit less money because we have to pay for facilities. So that model, we've proven that works. And I think that model is not just a model. It's a vision. And I think that cuts through all the other, you know, and acronyms and educational talk. You know, basic thing, small, safe school with high expectations where all the dollars gets to the school site and the parents are partners. You know, that plays well in uh, poor areas of New Haven, in Hartford, in Boyle Heights, and also Beverly Hills. In Beverly Hills, they pay 25 grand for that. At Green Dot, we our, our principals are the CEOs of the school, but they're also the instructional leaders. So we try to build an infrastructure around them that takes away the politics, the real estate, the business part. They own their own budgets, and we give assistance to help them. So they have they make the budget decisions at school sites. They have total hiring and firing um, uh, ability at that school. It's their team. I don't hire teachers; they hire them. Um, and, but we also hold them accountable. They're putting their teams together. Um, we, do a, uh, uh, we forecast assessments they have to hit. Um, but we also ask them to be a lot more Phil Jackson. You know, uh, they're coaches. They're instructional leaders. They're supposed to be in the classroom coaching and teaching and making teachers better. 
because that's our product, not sitting in, the, in their office, you know, planning golf games or walking around with a bullhorn, you know, or doing budgets. Their job is to be instructional leaders. Now, that, what I just described is a cultural shift that attracts a different kind of principal. You know, people want to be those kind of leaders. They want to start their own school. They want to transform a school, but they also want the, the respect and responsibility and support to pull it off. So I, I believe there's no teacher shortage in the country. There's a work condition problem. And so uh, right now, the stigma on teaching is it's not a profession, when it is actually one of the most important professions. We don't treat teachers like professionals. And, and pay is part of it, but it's not. That really, I think most people leave the profession, um, and I've seen studies on this. It's not so much just the money. It's the inability to have a say in what goes on in front of you. It's an inability to go into a, a culture that's, that, that, that demands success and accountability. And that drives people crazy. It drives younger people that are mission-driven out of the system. You hear this all the time. I see this all the time with my teachers. It's like, uh, you know, they, they come home for Christmas from, uh, you know, uh, Christmas break, and they see their college mates at a bar or at a cocktail party or a barbecue, and, and they go, hey, what are you doing now? And, oh, I'm teaching there. And they go, oh, that's great. Oh, that's so nice. It's so cool. I've always thought about doing that. I could never do that. Sucker. I mean, that's just, that's the, and what they should be saying is what an amazing job to have in your 20s is, how do I, God, I want to do that. How do I get to, how do I, how can I be, you know, invited into that kind of a profession, you know, with dignity? And it shouldn't be a sucker's bet, you know. And we've got to change the whole culture of schools to do that. Now, we, I think I do that with Green Dot. We pay our teachers more. They work at a 500-seat school instead of a 3,000-seat school, so they get to really have contact. And, they, and we have teacher-led schools, and we also have a teacher union contract that's specific to our schools. We have our un own union contract. Not the existing one, but the one that honors that mission. So they also have, so we also attract teachers who normally wouldn't work at a charter school because, you know, they're a little more grown up. They got a couple kids. They got a mortgage. They can't go work at some at-will charter school, you know, with hiring practices that way. But we look a little more grown up in their minds. So we, so last year, for example, in a city where, just, just like you mentioned in Bridgeport, where they've had to ask for leniency on No Child Left Behind, in the neighborhoods I serve, most public schools, half the teaching slots are done by substitutes because they don't have enough people to come in. They can't even find people from India to come. Um, we had 1,300 teachers apply for 90 jobs last year at Green Dot. The majority of them came from LAUSD. So certainly that's not a teacher shortage. That's a work condition issue. I think we're all new Americans. Some are newer. And I get the feed off of this first generation fervor. And it makes me yearn to know more about that first generation. My grandfather fled Nazi Germany and one other grandfather fled Ireland. And so there's something special and precious about the first generation. And they work two or three times harder. And you want to embrace that. And what's also exciting is when you use that same model for African American families. We have families like mine which are broken and pieced together. Um, but still surrounded by love and people, that they actually respond to being involved. And then the next frontier is the you know, middle class, upper middle class, who we were all educated by public schools, and now we're having to be double and triple taxed for private schools when we should be improving our public schools. And so I think there's a movement, I know in my city of Los Angeles and what's happening across the country, is if you can somehow bring all those, that parent revolt in a positive way, along with a teacher revolt, I'm very optimistic. And it's not like we don't know what works. So now what I think we've got to get in the business of doing is getting smart politically, you know, engaging the stakeholders that mean the most, which are the parents, the voter, who are voters, and the teachers who are a product, and demanding change. It's not like this is that hard. You know, I'm not I don't, being pessimistic makes absolutely no sense. You know? Eight years ago, I started the first high school in Los Angeles in 30 years, and now you have the whole city of Los Angeles talking about this issue. We're starting a school in the South Bronx with a teacher's union. I mean, that's, that's dramatic change. Um, but it'll happen a lot faster as we get smart politically and get smart about organizing families.